Hey everybody, welcome to the Old Guy Hi-Fi channel. My name's Ed. I had a good response to a recent video I did on classical music for rock fans, and so I thought I'd do a follow-up, not including the music for the hearing impaired, which no one really watched that video. <laughs> and that's fine. So what I thought I'd do is I'd do a new video, and this one is called Jazz with a side of funk and a pinch of fusion for rock fans. And the reason I did that was rather than go back to 50, 40s and 50s and do bop and that uh, kind of jazz, kind of blue, which is a great album, but I wanted to get something that was a bit more contemporary as jazz went through many uh, kind of changes during the 60s. It got more free form and then it kind of returned to mel a more a melodic state. And then, of course, with the influence of rock and, and we had the fusion movement with all kinds of stuff. You'll notice a theme going through here. A number of the artists that I'm going to talk about, and a number of the tracks I'm going to talk about, the artists were had performed with uh, Miles Davis. And so he had such a big influence on music in general. I mean, he significantly changed the landscape of jazz music three, maybe four times in his life. I mean, one of the most significant uh, jazz uh, musicians ever in history and, and certainly a genius. Whether you like him or not, he had an amazing impact on the on the music genre itself. So we're going to start out, there's 14 tracks in this, and I did create a playlist on title called Jazz with a side of funk and a pinch of fusion. And there'll be a link in the pin description, a pin comment below. Um, and in my des description of most of my videos, there is also other playlists of music I listen to, just in case you guys might be interested. So let's go ahead and start out. And the first one I want to talk about is a, a, from an album called Bags and Train. And the song is actually called Bags and Train. Now, Bags and Train, Bags was Milt Jackson, the famous vibraphone player who uh, went on to form the Modern Jazz Quartet, which is really a great group of people. And then Train was Coltrane, John Coltrane, who played with Miles on Kind of Blue, uh, Broke out on his own, did Love Supreme, all those kinds of, you know, Live at the Village Gate. Some amazing music. But this one is a little bit more melodic. Train kind of went off into the freeform, uh, not avant-garde, but freeform jazz. You know, the melodies are a little bit, you can find them, but you got to pull them out. This one is a lot more different. So this, and, and I'm, the material I'm going to read is kind of called from my own uh, personal experience and some stuff from online Wikipedia, just to get facts straight. So Bags and Train is a captivating jazz album that brings together two real geniuses. I mean, Milt Jackson and Train. It was recorded in 1961 on Atlantic Records. Now, it is mostly a Milt Jackson record. Train appeared on it, but all the compositions are by Milt Jackson. But Atlantic wanted to cash in on it because right as this uh, record was being released, Coltrane was leaving Atlantic Records to go to Impulse Records. So they wanted to kind of capitalize on his fame and obviously the, you know, kind of the buzz around uh, John Coltrane. So they, they, they promoted him more heavily than actually he really is, although he does perform on this track uh, and has a big influence on it. So uh, the album title playfully combines their nicknames, obviously. Um, it feels like stepping into a bright, exciting jazz environment with the two legends create magic together. It is a very upbeat. It's a really cool song. There's some good beats in it. You can you can see how this kind of music eventually got into rock and how this kind of music eventually got into fusion, which of course is kind of a fusion of rock and jazz together. So again, bags and train from the album of the same name. The next one is an absolute classic. This is probably one of my most favorite live jazz albums ever, ever, ever. It is remarkable. It is called Swiss Movement. And it was recorded in 1969 in Montreux, Switzerland. And it is Les McCann and Eddie Harris. And the song we're going to talk about is Cold Duck Time. Now, Les McCann is famous for his kind of uh, more well-known tune compared to what? That's on this album. But Cold Duck Time is unique in that. Uh, Eddie Harris hadn't played with the Les McCann trio uh, on stage before ever. And actually, they didn't see the music for this particular song until they got on stage. So it is very much, not ad lib, but very much ad hoc. So these guys are looking at it for the first time. They're riffing on it. They're, they're taking the melody and they're moving it all around. And one of the most amazing things is when Les McCann's banging away on his piano, you can hear him scatting under his breath to the music through the mics. The soundstage is excellent. Benny Bailey is amazing on this. 
uh, Leroy Vinegar, great combo. And again, Eddie Harris on sax. It's just, it's a tremendous album. Very, very much uh, worth, you know, finding out more about the whole album itself. Swiss Movement, Les McCann, Eddie Harris, uh, just amazing piece. Um, then Come Together. Now this one's interesting because it's a Beatles tune, Come Together. We all know that song. And it's done by a, real, a famous jazz flautist named Herbie Mann. And I'm a big Herbie Mann fan. And he was a very interesting guy in that he was not afraid to try contemporary rock, you know, kind of radio friendly music and take it and put his spin on it. So this is off of an album called Muscle Shoals Nitty Gritty. So he went down to Muscle Shoals, Alabama to record, as did a lot of people. You may remember Aretha in Chain of Fools, that opening. That was absolutely ad-libbed by the guys at Muscle Shoals, the, what they called them the Swampers. That was the backup group in the studio. And the Stones went recorded there. And obviously Leonard Skinner calls them out in one of their songs, Sweet Home Alabama. So uh, uh, Herbie went down to Muscle Shoals and recorded. And it's a 1970 album. So Muscle Shoals is in its heyday. They're just funking out. It's just amazing. So, and again, reading... According to the music press at the time, this album is often regarded as a masterpiece in one of the funkiest of Herbie Mann's uh, Memphis Southern collection. And he did a, several different ones. It'll have Memphis in the title. Memphis Underground is another great one you want to check out. Um, it's an often overlooked album in the Herbie Mann catalog. It's an essential collision of jazz and soul. And it's really, really interesting. The Muscle Shoals rhythm section plays the perfect foil for Herbie's aggressive flute attack and he was he could be really aggressive so the horns roll the piano rollicks the bass bubbles everything you want what's not to like so again come together off the herbie man album muscle shoals nitty gritty the next one we're going to go back a little bit more traditional this is a 1960 recording duke ellington in the orchestra off an album called blues in orbit and it's called swingers jump and it's a really good song and it the interesting thing about it is this was recorded, um, there were some recordings done in February of, of 1958. It was finalized in December of 1959 and released in 1960. But when they finalized the recordings in December of 1959, the Duke Ellington Orchestra had just come back from a European tour. So they went into the studio and it was kind of more of a loose jam than it was really a kind of a formal studio date. So you get that kind of ad lib, that um, adventurous kind of spirit that Lucy Goosey, I mean, these are not long form pieces. They're three, four or five minute long pieces, but, but uh, Swingers Jump, it rocks. It's great. There are some virtuoso performances in there. The sound stage is excellent. The audio quality is excellent for a 1960s recording. Um, it's just an outstanding piece. So there is a, a version available from Mobile Fidelity Sound Labs, and it's not a gold ultra disc. Um, it's just a regular one of the regular issue CDs. And then there's a new release that adds in a bunch of additional material because between those two sessions in February 58 and December of 59, they recorded a lot of stuff. Not all of it made it to the record. Um, and so it was uh, to uh, it, it's kind of interesting because when they got to the studio to record these songs, the copyist wasn't there to make copies of the music for all of the um, performers because they didn't have Xerox machines in those days and you couldn't copy a libretto. I mean, they're big pieces of music. So they really kind of winged it and that it really gets a sense of it. So it is, as one of the members of the press said, on one hand, the band was kicking back. On the other, the group was also improvising freely and intensively at various points. The swingers jump does just that with Ellington Company, Ellington and Company, romping and stomping all over the basic riff. Great song and, and a, a, a really led. The album itself is really good. This song is especially good. So the next one, we're going to go Miles, and Miles will make a couple of appearances in this list. So this one is Human Nature, and obviously that's a, a, a well-known Michael Jackson song that Miles took um, in this recording. I think it's in 19... Now, I don't know the date. I'll put it down here if I can find it. This was off an album, You're Under Arrest. And this was Miles' last album for with Warner, excuse me, with Columbia Records, with CBS. And he'd been with them for 30 years at this point. Um, and there was a music, uh, a, a, a movie made about Miles Davis' uh, life just recently. And in there, it kind of, you see the conflict um, between CBS and Miles because 
he had just been in a car accident. He was recovering. He had a, a drug and alcohol issue. He wasn't recording as frequently as CBS wanted, but his contract guaranteed him payments every month. So CBS was kind of holding back to get a new record out of him. So this one, while the record itself has a couple of good songs on it because it has Human Nature and the Cyndi Lauper song, Time After Time is also on this album. And he continued to play those two songs in his concert throughout his entire life. And it, that was really kind of interesting because they were kind of pop songs. So they made Miles a bit more accessible to the general public. So this is, as I said, his last album for CBS. And if you are familiar with um, uh, his sound, it, it's really interesting. I and mean, this album, he brought together some really cool, pl cool players. So he's got Bob Berg on tenor sax. He's got John Schofield on guitar. And on some of the tracks, on this particular track, it's John Schofield. And if you don't know who John Schofield is, listen to him. He is a great jazz guitarist. He's not like George Benson. He's not bubbly very upbeat. He's kind of darker and moody. And oh my goodness, is he a talent. And also on the album, you get John McLaughlin, who played with Miles in the, in the Miles Davis Quintet that did Bitches Brew and In a Silent Way and those things, that real heavy fusion stuff that Miles brought that kind of invented more or less or, or refined, certainly. Then of course, John McLaughlin went on to form the Mahavishnu Orchestra. So that's it. Now, another Miles song called Perfect Way. Now this was originally a, a Scritti Politi song, very pop song in England. Um, it didn't really do super great here in the U.S., but Marcus Miller, the producer on this album, and this is off the album Tutu, which is Miles' very first album with Warner Brothers. So they wanted to really kind of change things up. Under, You're Under Arrest did okay commercially. The, the songs um, Human Nature and Time After Time did very well. Obviously, they're, they're popular songs. But they really wanted to change it up, and they wanted to get more kind of a jazz funk feeling rather than a jazz fusion feeling. So... Uh, Marcus Miller, again, wanted to kind of give a new sound to Miles for his new record company and everything else. And Tutu is a humongous album. It was very seminal. And I'm going to quote something here. The reviewers wrote, Tutu became one of the defining jazz albums of the decade and attracted a, a young, new audience while alienating, and I like this part, many other traditional jazz listeners because of its heavy reliance on bass and synthesizers. As usual, Miles was pushing boundaries and never looking back. Now, one of the great things was I got to see Miles Davis at the Chicago Theater for this tour. My wife and I, my in-laws went, and it was awesome. Um, and he obviously passed away not too long after, oh, four or five years after this. But uh, it was an amazing concert. Now, one of the things that pisses, pissed off a lot of jazz aficionados, traditional jazz aficionados, about Miles, really starting in the late 60s, is he never played his old stuff. He didn't play anything off of Kind of Blue. He didn't pay, play anything off of uh, Sketches of Spain. He didn't play any of the Birth of the Cool stuff. He didn't play any of the uh, Someday My Prince Will Come stuff or Nefertiti or those kinds of albums. He went full into fusion and alienated a ton of people. I mean, I've got a wonderful concert video. He opened for Carlos Santana at um, Tanglewood and in 1970-ish, I guess, and Miles is playing his horn through a wah-wah pedal. It's crazy. It's a bit difficult to listen to, but it's really crazy. So, perfect way, great introduction to modern Miles sound, the funk, the, the kind of the rock, funk, jazz sort of thing, and, it, and that continued in some of his other albums. So the next track I want to talk about is called Speak No Evil, and it's off the album of the same name by Wayne Shorter. Now, here's the connection. Wayne Shorter was part of the Miles Davis Quintet during the In a Silent Way sessions and Bitches Brew and those kinds of things. So Wayne, tremendous saxophone, later went, became the, was the saxophonist for uh, Weather Report, which is, it was a great jazz fusion band. So on this record, he brings back his bandmates from the Miles Davis Quintet in the form of Herbie Hancock and Ron Carter, a great bass player. Um, and so th with this one, a lot of people felt that, uh, that Shorter kind of redefined himself and reappraised what he'd been doing in the past and really kind of took it in a new direction. Now, this particular track actually was remixed by Rudy Van Gelder. So it's a really nice track. Now we're going to go to Weather Report. And again, there's a Miles connection here because Joe Zwanel and Wayne Shorter were kind of the two key players in Weather Report and both had been with Miles during the In a Silent Way and Bitches Brews uh, era. And it's really interesting. So this is a track called Birdland. It's off the album Heavy Weather, which was their most popular uh, recording 
best-selling recording, and Birdland was their biggest hit ever. And it's a great bouncy tune. It kind of recalls, you know, that that jazz club sort of feel on 52nd Street in New York, New York in the 50s when you had Charlie Parker Bird on stage and so forth. It's really, really interesting. Um, to, uh, it's a quote. You ever? Excuse me. Quote, it evokes without any way in, in imitating a joyous evening on 52nd Street with a big band, unquote. Um, the other thing that's really interesting about this is th th their new bass player, a guy named Jaco Pastorius. Unbelievable uh, genius and a tremendously sad and, and heartbreaking story for that guy. But they, you know, Pastorius with his bass, he played fretless bass and he had a kind of a dancing staccato bass feeling. Um, and it, that bass acted almost as a third melodic voice with shorter on sax and zwanel on electric piano and keyboards and things like that. This one will get your toes tapping. Now, Jaco Pastorius was an amazing bass player. Everybody in the world thought he was a genius. He was absolutely amazing. And unfortunately, he had some mental, Ill mental illness issues and wind up dying homeless and broke in Florida. It was a really sad thing. Now, yet another, there's a theme here, another Miles Davis connection here. Romantic Warrior is the name of the song and name of the album by a band called Return to Forever, which was Chick Corea. And of course, Chick Corea was part of the Miles Davis Quintet during the In a Silent Way and Bitches Brew era. Um, and this by, by, is by far and away their most popular album and their most popular song. So the band was Chick Corea, Stanley Clark, great jazz player, Lenny White, and Al DiMiola, who is one of the finest jazz guitarists, maybe a guitarist period, of all time, uh, was for a long time known as the world's fastest guitarist. And if you listen to some of his early stuff, it's unbelievable. Like Elegant Gypsy, it's a great Al DiMiola album. So this one is... Um, Interesting in that you can, by, when you listen to it, you can hear that there was a huge influence from the prog rock era that was going on at this time in the early 70s. So you had Yes and Genesis and uh, Von der Graaff Generator and Camel and obviously Pink Floyd and all of that, all those great prog rock artists. And so there is a bit of a prog rock feeling to this, along with kind of some traditional jazz elements. But they kind of, it's again, it, this is kind of that fusion of of not necessarily straight ahead rock and roll, but prog rock and jazz. So it's really, really interesting. Um, it's just outstanding. Unfortunately, this was the last album they did together as a group. So Romantic Warrior, Return to Forever. Now we're going to go offshore and not related to Miles Davis, although the guy's a trumpeter. Um, it's a song named Eleanor Rigby. And I don't have the name of the album. I'll put it down here when I get it in the video by a guy named Till Broner. And Till is a, a West German tra uh, uh, trumpeter, flugelhorn player, that kind of thing. And he is one of the top jazz musicians in certainly in Germany and certainly in Europe. And on this track, there is just the trumpet, just the bass and an occasional drum. So it, there's an instant tension created by the minimalism of the song. And with the absence of, you know, no harmony instrument, right? Uh, so as a listener, you have to supply an implied harmony yourself. So it involves you in the listen. And it's really interesting. And it's not hard to pick up and put that harmony in your head. It really isn't. Um, it is a challenge, obviously, for the, for the listener. But I think you're up to the task. Give it a listen. Let me know what you think in the comments. Um, it really is a cool modern jazz interpreta interpretation of basically a, a Beatles ballad or, a, a, you know, kind of a, a moderate paced Beatles piece. So that's really cool. Now we're going to go to Philadelphia, Grover Washington Jr., Soulful Strut. And that's off the album called Soulful Strut. Um, Grover Washington Jr. was an amazing uh, musician, um, all the way back from the early seventies on the Kudzu records. Um, if you get a chance, check out his album called soul box. It's just outstanding. Um, I count myself very fortunate. I had an opportunity to just to meet Grover Washington at, at an event, uh, hosted by Dr. J and his wife. We did some work with them when we lived in Philadelphia. Um, and it was just a charity event and it was, I'd shake hands kind of thing, but I always admire him. And, uh, as a matter of fact, my wife and I, our favorite song or our song together is just the two of us off the album Wine Light, sung by Bill Withers. So a very, you know, I have a, a great connection with uh, Grover Washington Jr. Soulful Strut is kind of 
coming out in, I think it's 1976, and we're the, kind of the disco era is starting, a dance club sort of thing. It's not full-blown, you know, we are family and, uh, you know, uh, shake your groove thing kind of stuff. But there's kind of a dance, a, a dance vibe to this for sure, but it's really, it's soulful and jazz. And of course, Grover Washington is a, a very great, you know, jazz musician in his own right, as well as being a great soul musician. So it is very common. It's a, it's a commercial piece, no question. You can tell it is, but it, that makes it more accessible, I think. Um, and, you know, Grover Washington always had this kind of subtle, relaxed groove in his music. You just knew that it was, he was just really uh, laying it out there. No, no aggressiveness, no in your face kind of stuff, just nice and smooth and gorgeous and textured. And you could hear, I mean, just an amazingly talented guy. Uh, so it would be, you know, this is a, a great one for, uh, you know, soul jazz fans, I think, personally. Now we go back to Miles Davis again. Now this is off an album called Doobop. And this is an interesting album in that there's a very good chance that a lot of the tracks on this were recorded or put together after Miles' death. Um, he went into the studio and there, there's, you know, months worth of tape with Miles just freeforming or doing whatever, riffing on, on uh, you know, music melodies and things like that. And I think some of, the, some of the songs were definitely performed in studio with other musicians, like the one I'm going to talk about. But other sections of the album, I think, they took recordings that Miles had already done and kind of mixed them in and then had a band play over them. It doesn't make them invalid. It'd just be nice to know that Miles was in the, in the studio with those uh, musicians. So this one is called Mystery. And again, it's from the album Doobop. And if you're familiar with the On the Corner album, which was kind of a, uh, you know, that album kind of predated hip hop, but it had hip hop beats in it. And it had that kind of uh, what would become hip hop and kind of more boppy soul kind of thing. Um, so this one, this album, uh, Doobop, is actually you know an offspring of it. The Miles worked with a producer, Easy Mo D, which was known for he was known for hip hop and that kind of stuff. And it really works extraordinarily well. Um, it's not for the traditional jazz fan or Miles fan, the kind of blue era stuff. Um, it is you know. Any traditional jazz uh, fan who will listen to this won't find any solace with this record. It is definitely interesting and different. And again, it's Doobop. Uh, uh, the album is Doobop. The track is Mystery from Miles Davis. Now, yet another Miles Davis alumni, Herbie Hancock. This is Doing It, and this is off the album Secrets. Now, this uh, song, Doing It, was actually written by Ray Parker Jr., who you may, may remember got most famous in the in the public consciousness for the Ghostbusters theme, who are you gonna call, right? And this recording is really restrained, it's rolling grooves rather than really high energy funk. Um, you know, obviously Hancock had established his credentials in jazz and funk. I mean, the guy was a prodigy. He was performing with the uh, Chicago Symphony Orchestra, uh, I think when he was 14, um, I think he, went on tour and uh, I know he toured with Miles in the early 60s as part of one of the original quintets. And I think he was 16 or 17 years old. Guy's a genius. Um, so anyway, this one is one of his own. He did have some great players on it. Bernie Maupin, who was a great saxophonist. And obviously Ray Parker Jr., a tremendous jazz guitarist, is on this as well. So it's a success. This is doing it as the most, probably best track on the album. Um, it is, uh, you know, like I said, it's got a bit of a, the dance vibe for it. So it's, you know, tracks heading for the dance floor. The tune is basically one long, irresistible groove with a, you know, it's got a very commercial sounding bridge, which obviously you need to do if you want to sell records. Um, it is really, really enjoyable. And um, I think you'll find it an extraordinarily satisfying listen. So did I say there were 13 or 14? I think there's, did I miss one? I may have. I'm going to edit Should this in between, it? right before the ending. I remembered what the 14th track was, and it was St. James Infirmary by Louis Armstrong, Satchmo himself. Now, you cannot think about jazz music without thinking about Louis Armstrong. He may have been the single most influential jazz player pre-19, mid-1950s, and even on, extraordinarily popular, played to 
uh, on TV all the time, very, very popular, very commercially successful. St. James Infirmary is also called The Gambler's Lament, and it's a famous song. It's been done by a zillion people, but this one is an album called Satchmo Plays King Oliver, and there's two versions of it, and both there, on, on both Tidal and Cobuzz, there is a full HD version. This was recorded kind of in the day as an audio file recording. It's absolutely spectacular. And when you hear the gravel in Louis Armstrong's voice, when you hear that the tone of his trumpet and just how magnificently talented he, excuse me, he was, it's remarkable. He is just probably... He's on a different level than any, he and Miles Davis and a couple of other handful of jazz musicians are on a totally different level. But Louis was there from the beginning, all the way back in the 1920s, early 1920s. So he was a seminal influence in how jazz evolved from kind of that Dixieland New Orleans style all the way through up until the late 40s and early 50s when you started to get into uh, bebop. And, and then obviously in the early 50s, Birth of the Cool with Charlie Parker and those guys. Um, and then of course, Miles was part of that as well. But Louis Armstrong stayed completely relevant and was probably uh, and may still be the most popular jazz musician ever. So again, uh, St. James Infirmary off of the album Satchmo Plays King Oliver. Thanks so much. And I apologize for the goofy edit. Um, anyway, so that's the uh, jazz with a side of funk and a pitch of fusion for rock fans uh, overview and playlist. So I would appreciate it if you guys let me know in the comments what you think. Um, are there tracks that I should have included? Um, do you like the tracks? Do you not like the tracks? What about them do you like? What about them don't you like? I really appreciate that. So the playlist will be pinned in the pin, will be in the pinned comment. And in the description of all my videos at the bottom, once you get past all the equipment listing is, uh, a list of title playlists that I put together that are available for you guys to look at. And again, I'd love to get your feedback on that. So please, if you enjoyed this, give me a like. Um, I would greatly love to get your subscription. I'm trying to get to a thousand subscribers um, and I'm not sure why other than it's just a nice milestone to get to. Um, and I, I really appreciate your feedback as any of you who have commented know I do respond to the comments and I try to respond quickly. Um, you can also, if you have something you want longer form or more involved, you can email me at oldguyhifi at gmail.com. And I check that once a day or every other day, and I will respond as well. So thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for tuning in. Again, please give me a like and a subscribe if you enjoyed this content. And you guys have a really wonderful day. It's Ed from Old Guy Hi-Fi signing off.